Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today we are going to be getting in the sort of deep academic and technical weeds of sociology by looking at a very famous and important work called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life by the founder of the field of sociology itself, the discipline of sociology, Emil Durkheim. And so this is the big book that we're going to be looking at. And I promise that actually today's stream, though, we're going to be looking at the ideas of a secular atheist Jew scholar of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Many of the ideas we're going to be going over today are going to be extremely applicable in the way we look at society now with what's going on in regards to the sort of chaos we're seeing in, in the in the post-COVID area, if you will. So uh, if you guys can in the YouTube chat, can you throw a thumbs up? Uh, let me know audio is good. Um, so we are going to first kind of introduce who Emil Durkheim is, talk about his approach, his sort of epistemology that he was working off of in, again, the late 19th century, early 20th century as a scholar. And then what he, you know, really sort of how he founded the field. And then we're going to be diving straight into this big old tome here. Again, his work, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. And so I've got some uh, cheat sheets here regarding Durkheim and some of his ideas and then specifically on the re forms of religious life, his famous book that we're going to be going over today. So um, before we go any further, I do want to say that for those of you interested, uh, memberships are now available. The I have how many do I have? I have, um, let's see here. Um, I have about five main points that we're going to be going over from this book today, uh, such as society as God, uh, the, the, the sociological. So the, a lot of these are really sociological tools that we can, you know, conceptual tools we can put in our, our tool belt when looking at culture, when looking at society. And, and so one of them is this idea of collective effervescence, uh, collective representation, categories of understanding, and uh, societal ideals and how we actually look at cultural conflicts. So again, this is something that he was talking about in the late 19th, early 20th century that are extremely applicable for us today, though we are going to differ greatly with much of the presuppositions of the worldview of the paradigm Mil Durkheim was coming from. So um, very interesting stuff. I, what I was trying to say was I have about five to six really solid points that we're going to be going over and, and then reading. We're going to be reading a lot from his book. If you, if anybody takes like an intro to sociology, for example, you would read this book. You would be familiar with who Emil Durkheim is. He's the founder of sociology. And reading him, you actually come across some really interesting ideas that are still, like I said, very applicable today. And so even though we're going to disagree with a lot of things he has to say, some of it is really interesting. Um, testicular tactics. Who's all streaming right now? You said everybody's streaming right now. Let me, uh, let me, uh, pull up YouTube and see who else is streaming. Oh, Dyer streaming right now. Oh, gotcha. So, uh, so where do we begin? Um, well, first of all, what I was saying is that we're going to have about, two to three points that I'm actually saving just for members only. So when I get off here, I'm actually going to be filming uh, a video just for the members only. So if you guys are interested in the exclusive content that's available over at my website, go to davidpatrickcarry.com. Um, Church of the eternal logos.com takes you to the same place and you can access members only content for $5 a month. We'd greatly appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Base philosophy. Mom said Jay is streaming. I think, and you're making us pick. <laughs> well, I appreciate anybody who's here and chose me. I, I just pulled it up. It looked like Jay and Snacker are um, streaming right now. But uh, given just priorities I have during the day, I always do uh, a Zoom class. So my church, 
that I go to, I help with like setting up a Zoom course. So every Wednesday night at seven o'clock, we usually do a theology course and, and we're reading, we kind of go through methodically this book right here on the incarnation by St. Athanasius. And so because of that, on Wednesdays, I absolutely have to to uh, stream before that unless I have no choice. So I'll probably run a little bit late into class tonight, but um, I needed to do that. And I've been off for a week. So I had a wedding. Some of you guys who follow me online uh, on, on Instagram, for example, know that I've been kind of sharing a bunch of stories that I was at my buddy's wedding and that lasted from basically the festivities from Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So because of that, um, <laughs> so because of that, we, uh, I haven't been able to stream for like a week. And so I was really anxious to kind of get back on here and, uh, and, and do stuff. So anyways, without further ado, let's just sort of get into the content. I know maybe the numbers aren't going to be as, as high today because Jay is streaming with snack over on his channel. But, uh, for those of you who choose to be here, I greatly appreciate that. So, Emil Durkheim, like I said, he's the founder of the, the discipline, the academic discipline of sociology. <clears throat> uh, Ray said, I appreciate that you react back to, your, to our comments, to your stories. Hey, no problem, brother. Uh, I try to react to everybody's comments, whether they're on my YouTube videos or Instagram or whatever it is. So, so he is a French sociologist. Emile Durkheim lived from, well, he was born in April 15th, 1858, and he died on November 15th, 1917. So it's kind of, it's kind of rare that a guy is actually born and dies on the same uh, number of day of the month. You know what I mean? Uh, so interesting there. His first major work was called The Division of Labor in Society. That was written in 1893. And so this is really right before he basically founds uh, the school of sociology, the discipline of sociology. And he was very much interested in a, in a functionalist approach. And so when we look at his analysis today, these really important ideas like collective effervescence, collective representations, categories of understanding, he is approaching this. Again, he's an atheist, secular Jew. And he's approaching this from what's called the functionalist school, right? Everything has a functional method. And we're going to get into his epistemology and how this was actually formed by um, August Comte and his sort of positivism, this idea that they wanted to take scientific epistemology, this idea that you come up with a hypothesis and then you do experiments in the world to, to prove its validity. They wanted to do this for the social sciences. And so... Comte really come up, came up with positivism for the social scientists, uh, social sciences, sorry. And Durkheim wanted to build upon the work that he had already done. Uh, Jimmy said, I just jumped off JStream to support you. Well, I appreciate that, Jimmy. Uh, greatly do. I understand. I didn't, I didn't mean to cause people to, uh, to choose between the two. I just don't have a, a choice in regards to timing. So... <clears throat> Um, I had to hop on it either way. So if you guys can smash that like, I always appreciate that. And I understand that there's so many viewing options, uh, in the world right now that even if you weren't watching Jay, my gosh, you have all of Netflix, which is pretty degenerate, but you have so many options. You have all of YouTube and the fact that you guys are here, I truly appreciate that. So his first major work, like I said, was the division of labor and society. And so one of the things, the concepts that Durkheim was really interested in putting forth, like we said, he's, he's trying to use a sort of scientific epistemology, positivism, um, or what he called sort of um, sociological realism, stuff like that, to create what he called social facts. Social facts. And there's material social facts and there's non-material social facts. And so the material social facts would be like structural, institutional components of society, state, church, etc. And then there's also uh, morphological components of society, meaning population distribution, crime rates, housing arrangements. These are all material social facts when you're when you were to analyze a society, right? And then there's non-material social facts, social currents 
collective representations, collective conscience, morality. And these are the things that we're going to be getting into today. Because I think when we talk about, again, collective representations, collective effervescence, they're going to ring true. And I'm telling you, it's going to be astonishing how interesting the things that he's saying. Uh, this book was written in, um, what was it, 1917? I'll double check. I think I have it written down somewhere. But um, it's amazing the way he's talking about Aboriginal society. So this whole book, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, Durkheim is looking at and studying Aboriginal, really, ethnographies from Australia, looking at Ab Aboriginal groups, and com coming up and constructing sociological theories of religion, of how societies form. And this is going to be based centrally on his concept of totism, totemism, uh, so the sort of totemic principle, this idea that we all, or societies, establish totems, right? This comes from the concept of a totem pole, and then you crawl all these different animals, that's, i.e., the thumbnail, that the totem animal, the totem spirit, the totem symbol that a society revolves around is essential in creating clans, in creating groups, in creating religion, in creating societies. And so, that is his beginning point, and when he begins to look at societies and stuff like that. Um, now, his seminal monograph, right before really establishing himself as a sociologist, right, because this field didn't exist yet, um, was Le Suicide. And this was his study on suicide rates within Catholic and Protestant nations. It's actually a very interesting book. Um, <clears throat> Not necessarily you need to read it, you know, read your church fathers, read your scripture, stuff like that. But it is interesting nonetheless. And it was pioneering research. Again, what he was doing is, is really constructing a lot of these sociological theories that are still used today and arguing for their validity and then establishing them in practice. And so he did this in a variety of forms. But his beginning one was looking at suicide rates and then constructing social, you know, using these idea of social facts and stuff like that. Now, it, and it, it's 1912, I'm sorry, when he writes The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. So 1912 is what we're going to be reading today, and I'm telling you, it's going to be astonishing how insightful some of the stuff he says is in regards to looking at BLM, looking at post-COVID uh, understanding, look at the mask, right, these mask mandates, and maybe what they symbolize and how they work, again, at a larger sociological level, and the sort of embodiment that they do within uh, individuals, the collective effervescence, the, the social feelings, all the stuff we're going to be getting into. And it, I'm telling you, it's going to be really interesting. Um, but I wanted to speak before we get further into like what his epistemology is. How is he coming to understand knowledge? How is he basing something to be true? And like I said, he refines Augustus Comte's um, positivism. So, so um, August Comte was another French intellectual, and like I said, he was con he was promoting scientific epistemology, but using it for social sciences. Durkheim wanting to develop sociology does the builds upon this, and what he calls epistemological realism: objects exist in reality independently of our conceptions. And this is really important for Durkheim because we have to remember when we read all this stuff. Again, he's an atheist that society is the end-all be-all, that for him, society is what's constructing individuals, constructing human personality types, constructing um, categories of thought, categories of knowledge, collective representations, as we'll get into. And so his epistemological realism, objects exist in reality independently of our conceptions, is really important because for him, his presupposition going into his study, his presupposition going into his sociological work is that the minds of individuals are shaped by society and that there's this continual feedback loop. But once the feedback loop starts, really it's society, the larger collective of society that has all the power. And so we'll, we'll, we'll understand this a little bit more the further we get into it. But he was very much interested in using the hypothetical deductive model. Again, this is just a fancy academic term for saying the scientific method, right? You come up with a hypothesis, then you come up with a way to test it, then you test it, and you see the difference between the results and your hypothesis. So this is what he was wanting to do for sociological things like studying religion. 
And so sociolo- sociology for Durkheim was the science of institutions, the science of institutions. He often he said it this way, and that he's interested in the beliefs and modes of behavior instituted by the collectivity. So again, this feedback loop that it takes the collective to establish so much of these things, whether it be the myths, the religions, the moralities, the symbols, um, the categories of thought, and therefore, it's really society that, emphasize, that, that exerts all the pressure on people. And so he wants to discover structural social facts, as I said, and there's material and non-material social facts. We're going to be focusing on non-material social facts today and how he used them to understand religion, but how we can use them to understand really what's going on with BLM, Antifa, and all this stuff in regards to the COVID chaos in our society. And so... Structural functionalism is often sort of the considered to be the framework that Durkheim works off of. And, and stru- structural f- functionalism is the framework for building theory that sees society as a complex system whose parts work together to promote solidarity and stability. Solidarity and stability. And so we've talked previously about the American sociologist Peter Berger and his theory of legitimation and how, um, how things become externalize, objectified, internalized, and then there's the feedback loop. So Durkheim would probably agree with much of that, but he would definitely not put much uh, power in in the hands of the individual, that mostly it's all society for Durkheim. And so so that's where we're going to end there in regards to talking about uh, Durkheim, just giving a background into today's video. But before I get into these main concepts that I wanted to talk about, we have to understand what um, totemism is. And so the totems, like I said, the totem poles, and that this is the central concept for Durkheim, for his understanding of how society begins to form and almost like a, um, it's like a, a spiraling nature, right? That there has to be a center point that everything begins to really revolve around. And for him, it's the totem. And he, he's looking at Aboriginal society. He's looking at Native, Native American societies and how they erect animal spirits. Mostly is what he's talking about is animal spirits. And again, he's, he's early 20th century. So the way he talks about primitive people, primitive religions, primitive culture, um, you could say it's a bit pejorative. But uh, um, this concept is central for him. So the first thing that I want to get into is society as God. And actually, I was going to write all these on the screen. So let me do that real quick. Um, There we go. Make that available. Society as God. And let me just put a number one next to that. So people watching later can uh, better understand. So the first thing I want to get into is society as... Let me turn this down a bit. Society as God. And I wanted to read, let's see here. Um, oh, actually, I had, a, I had a quick reading I wanted to say right before that. So before we get into society as God, um, <clears throat> there's a section here that I want to read. And what this is what we're going to be doing most of today is I want to read Durkheim to you guys, right? Because that's what I like to do is is this is sort of a shortcut. I mean, maybe you want to read these books yourself. That's fine. But anybody that's getting into like the academic field of sociology, you're going to have to read this whole thing that I'll just read parts of it to you that I deemed really important. And so you can understand. So because he's working on a functionalist understanding of the definition of religion, he doesn't see religion as, as containing ultimate truth in and of themselves. So the idea of like apologetics, what Dyer does, what I attempt to do or stuff like that, or, or Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias and his debates, that we're arguing that one tradition is superior to another tradition. Durkheim is not working off that premise whatsoever. And so I wanted to read the sort of premise that he's working off of. And he says, fundamentally, then, there are no religions that are false. All are true after their own fashion. All fulfill given conditions of human existence, though in different ways. Granted, it is not impossible to rank them hierarchically in different ways. Some can be said to be superior to others in the sense that they bring higher mental faculties into play 
that they are richer in ideas and feelings, that they contain proportionately more concepts than sensations and images, and that they are more elaborately systematized. But the greater complexity of higher ideal content, however real, are not sufficient to place the corresponding religions into separate genre. All are equally religious, just as all living beings are equally living beings from the humblest plastid to man. If I address myself to primitive religions, then it is not with any ulterior motive of disparaging religion in general. These religions are not to be respected no less than any others. They fulfill the same needs, play the same role, and proceed from the same causes. Therefore, they can serve just as well to elucidate the nature of religious life, and it follows to solve the problem I wish to treat. And if I continue to reading, he would talk about that even though he recognizes that some religions are what he would consider more complex, more sophisticated, he would say the, the way in which you'd actually study those is to then to trace those ideas back. Because, again, he's working off of Darwinian, a very evolutionary framework here. So he thinks he's, he's basically taking evolutionary theory and looking at that in regards to ideas, in regards to sociology. So that's why he's beginning with these, quote unquote, primitive religions, is that the primitive religions allow him to get more at the sort of um, conceptual basis of how this stuff works, where if he was analyzing a more sophisticated society, in his opinion, that it would be more difficult because of the complexity. He would then, to come up with his theories, have to trace these things all the way back to their origin point. So why don't we just start with the origin point? This is his understanding. All right, let me take a drink real quick. All right. So this is his beginning point. Now, I wanted to speak to society as God. And what I wanted to keep in mind as I read this to you guys is the precept of atheistic collectivistic ideologies. And obviously something like a communism here comes to mind that society is God because they're, you know, again, Durkheim is an atheist, so he's, he doesn't believe in God. That society is the sort of ultimate force that exerts upon individuals. And I think so much of what we see in society, we're beginning to see that sort of bifurcation in society, that everything is culturally constructed, right? This is a common critique of sociologists in general, much of academia, much of even leftist understandings, is that there is nothing objective. You know, this is part of the postmodern worldview that uh, everything is just a social construction and therefore you get into Foucault's power knowledge, you know, dialectic that power, that knowledge isn't objective in and of itself. That knowledge is, is in really in relation to the people who hold power in society and what they deem to be knowledge. Now we as Christians absolutely would not hold to that worldview. And that's why those people were again, so in opposition to much of what we believe in. But when he talks about society as God, keep in mind some of the people who believe this because he's really setting the basis. This is 1912. He's writing this book. He's setting the basis for so much of the thought that then people have adopted already in our society. So many of the BLM, the Marxists, right? Um, they are really launching from what we're getting ready to read from Durkheim. So let me flip over to 208. Okay. So here, here's Durkheim on society and how it is God, okay? Society in general simply... Oh, hold on, I need to make this visible. There we go. Society is God. Society in general, simply by its effect on men's minds, undoubtedly has all that is required to arouse the sensation of the divine. A society is to its members what a God is to its faithful. A God is, first of all, a being that man conceives of as superior to himself in some respects and one on whom he believes he depends. Whether that being is conscious per, a conscious personality like Zeus or Yahweh or play of abstract forces as in totemism. So this is totemism, again, his theory regarding uh, animal spirits regarding the the sort of primitive way in which societies form around a singular principle. That totem pole is, is a good way to just think about it. The faithful believe they are bound in certain ways to, of acting that the nature of the sacred principle they are dealing with has imposed upon them. Society also 
fosters in us the sense of perpetual dependence, precisely because society has its own specific nature that is different from our nature as individuals. It pursues ends that are also specifically its own. So again, you, this, this concept that somehow society itself, uh, because he believes in collective consciousness, again, this is, bef well, this is around the time of Jung, so you can see again how they're playing back and forth on ideas, that co collective consciousness is absolutely replete within Durkheim's theories, that, um, that society itself is the sort of amalgamation of all the individual consciousness of people. He really, so he's very much of this idea. Precisely because society has its own specific nature that is different from our nature as individuals, it pursues ends that are also specifically its own. But because it can achieve those ends only by working through us, it, ca it categorically demands our cooperation. Society requires us to make ourselves its servants, forgetful of our own interests, and it subjects us to all sorts of restraints, privations, and sacrifices without which social life would be impossible. And so at every instant, we must submit to rules of action and thought that we have neither made nor wanted and that sometimes are contrary to our inclinations and to our most basic instincts. If society could exact those concessions and sacrifices only by physical constraint, it could arouse in us only the sense of a physical force to which we have no choice but to yield and not that of a moral power such as religions venerate. In reality, however, the whole society has over consciousness owes far less to the pejorative its physical superiority gives it than to the moral authority with which it is invested. We differ to society's orders not simply because it is re equipped to overcome our resistance, but first and foremost because it is the object of genuine respect. So, there's, so then he goes on, this is on, if we skipped about a page and a half, he goes on to say, a God is not only an authority to which we are subject, but also a force that buttresses our own. The man who has obeyed his God and who for this reason thinks he has his God with him, approaches the world with confidence and a sense of heightened energy. In the same way, society's workings do not stop at demanding sacrifices, privations, and efforts from us. The force of the collectivity is not wholly external. It does not move us entirely from the outside. Indeed, because society can exist only in and by means of individual minds, it must enter into us and become organized within us. That force thus becomes an integral part of our being and by the same stroke uplifts and brings it to maturity. So speaking more on this idea, we see that for, so, for Durkheim, our conceptions of God itself are totally dependent upon society and this feedback loop of these external, this externalized force. But it's then upon, so using, you could use Peter Berger, and I have his book right down here. Uh, right Here's Peter Berger in The Sacred Canopy, American Sociologist of the 20th century, mid-20th century. But this feedback loop of society pushing down these ideals on us, we adopting these values and then pr promoting and enacting out the intentions and desires of society. Now, we don't tend to think like this, um, but... I want to get this in our sort of mindset, in the in a sort of front of our minds, because when we look at collective effervescence, when we look at these collective representations, I think those who are manipulating society in regards to the BLM, in regards to a lot of these protests, in regards to a lot of the politics, they're absolutely aware of these processes. And they're absolutely aware of the ultimate importance culture and society actually enact on individuals. And so we as Christians have to be conscientious of this and of course revert back to the ultimate power being God himself, being scripture, being tradition, um, as opposed to allowing society to shape and mold us. And that's exactly the problem with we would see with the Christian churches that are really promoting a sort of religion of be a good person, uh, the promoting the homosexuality, the BLM stuff. Um, 
it, it, it's all a way to, it's all a way in which society is exerting force back onto individuals and then they're enacting out these principles in society. And so, again, from a theological perspective, we would say, well, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen society. And so if we allow society to continually shape us, that's only going to lead us in the wrong direction, right? And so um, I think this idea that society is God or society as God is really an important idea that many people in our culture actually assume right? Like I said, many sociologists, many academics assume that everything is culturally constructed. People are working off of sort of relativistic morality, you know, say these things. <clears throat> yeah, based philosophy, mom said, to be a good person really screws people over despite sounding like it shouldn't. Exactly, because um, what has happened is toleration has become a virtue in and of itself without reference to what is being tolerated, right? I.e. cuties, i.e. the normalization and sexualization of children. Um, why is that Why is that a beneficent thing? Why is it a virtue to tolerate those things in society? Well, if we're working off a of relativistic, you know, morality, it, it's quite clear to see how these things come about. But I want to move now to collective effervescence. And we're going to be looking at... Um, you know, to give a just a quick sneak peek, uh, you know, under the influence of some great collective shock in certain historical periods, social interactions become much more frequent and active. And so when I read this next section, I really, really want you guys to um, keep in mind what's going on with COVID, because I think this is this collective effervescence um, and how at certain periods in time, especially in great chaos, how it evokes these certain behavioral patterns within humans, or as he talks about this sort of yearning to be a radical, uh, radical heroism, superhuman heroism. Just, just, just keep in mind, keep thinking about present society as I read this. This is a concept called, oh, let me change it up here. Um, collective effervescence. There we go. Okay. Okay. Collective effort vest. Ah, I should have put number two. Dang it. There we go. Okay. Apart from these passing or intimate states, there are more lasting ones in which the fortifying action of society makes itself felt with long-term consequences and often with more striking effect. Under the influence of some great collective shock in certain historical periods, social interactions become much more frequent and active. Okay, so a collective shock in historical periods, social interactions become much more frequent. Now, keep in mind social distancing in the time of COVID. We have an immense social shock happening right now. And then think about what he's getting ready to say. And, if, uh, and then think about social distancing, no church, all this stuff. The result is the great general effervescence that is characteristic of revolutionary or creative epochs. The result of that heightened activity is a general stimulation of individual energies. People live differently and more intensely than in normal times. The changes are not simply of nuance and degree. Man himself becomes something other than what he was. He is stirred by passion so intense that... They can be satisfied only by violent and extreme acts, by acts of superhuman heroism or bloody barbarianism. And before I go on, think about that. Think about the protest. Think about what we're seeing in societies. Thinking about the looting and the rioting. Um, it, we're, living it, we're living in that time. Um, but the next part is what I think is being prevented by the no church uh, in certain areas, uh, you know, limiting social groups unless, you know, the Lakers win a championship somehow, then everybody's able to be in the streets, but you can't go to church. This explains the Crusades, for example, as well as 
so many sublime or savage moments in the French Revolution. We see the most mediocre, the media, I'm sorry, mediocre or harmless uh, bourgeois transformed by the general exaltation into a hero or an execu executioner. And the mental processes are so clearly the same as those at the root of religion that the individuals themselves conceived the pressure they yield to in explicitly religious terms. The crusaders believed they felt God present among them, calling on them to go forth and conquer the Holy Land, and Joan of Arc believed she was obeying celestial voices. This stimulating action of society is not felt in exceptional circumstances alone. There is virtually no instant of our lives in which a certain rush of energy fails to come to us from outside ourselves. And all kinds of acts that express the understanding, esteem, and affection of his neighbor, there is a lift that the man who does his duty feels, usually without being aware of it. But that lift sustains him. The feeling society has for him uplifts the feeling he has for himself, because he is in moral harmony with his neighbor. He gains new confidence, courage, and boldness in action, quite like the man of faith who believes he feels the eyes of his God turned benevolently toward him. Thus is produced what amounts to a perpetual uplift of our moral being, since it varies according to a multitude of external conditions, whether our relations with the social group that surround us are more or less active and what those groups are, we cannot help but feel that this moral toning up has an external cause, though we do not see where that cause is or what it is. So we readily conceive of it in the form of a moral power that, while imminent in us, also represents something in us that is other than ourselves. And so, what I wanted to highlight with that second paragraph is this relationship with neighbors and how that 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 gives a sense of collectivity uh, uh, that provides a, a an emotional cohesion? Um, what are we seeing in society right now? The inability of people that are in, op in opposition to most of the things going on to congregate together, to organize together, to actually attain what he would consider that collective effervescence. And so when we get to the collective representations, which is the next thing I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ray, the mu the mu uh, Ray, the musician says, I can picture a militant atheist getting so hyped over what you're reading. <laughs> yeah, basically um, that, that building of confidence and courage and boldness is really being prevented to occur amongst those who are in opposition to much of this. So, so that revolutionary effervescence, that revolutionary effervescence that he just talked about, um, we see how that is being squashed in opposition, but how it's being promoted in regards to, um, well, the, 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 the sort of BLM, the leftist stuff, which we're going to get into in regards to the cultural conflict based on varying societal ideals and how really what we're seeing in regards to the left and the right and what we're seeing in, in, in culture. And this is why so many sort of moderates are now turning towards Trump and, and we see the MAGA movement growing is because that society and when societies clash with each other, when there's wars that are occurring, it's a clashing of conceptual ideals it's way more than just race it's way more than just um um you know a, a particular instance and in, you know it's way more than just george floyd for example it is these societal ideals which then are going the categories of understanding so when we get into like critical race theory this houses these, these understanding like critical race theory houses the societal ideals of the left. So, uh, so when Trump bans that stuff again, not that he's know knowledgeable of all this sort of sociological theory, but that is really what's occurring in my opinion is, uh, he is squashing the ability for these categories to again, promoted in society and then embedded within individual psyches, which then are going to act that out into society. So the next one that I want to get into is collective representations. And, and this one is a very interesting one. Um, and so let me change the words real quick. So we're going to go to the three. 
and rep presentations. <clears throat> so collective representation. So we're going to get into this concept of social feelings. We're going to get into uh, understanding how we inscribe feelings into durable things into reality. So really what I want you to keep in mind as I read through this, think about the masks and how the masks are working as a symbol because we know the science that, you know, the, the effectiveness of surgical masks and cloth masks. This is all the joke, right? We all know this. So then what, how are these masks working? Why uh, do we see like the left's, uh, the leftist, anybody that is of more of a leftist bent is going to be way more prominent in the promoting of the wearing of the mask. So the mask is really a symbol of something. And, and so think about that as we read through here and I'll highlight exactly what part I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about that, but collective representations, collective representations are quite another matter. They presuppose that consciousnesses are acting and reacting on each other. They result from actions and reactions that are possible only with the help of tangible intermediaries. Thus, the function of the intermediaries is not merely to reveal the mental state associated with them. They also contribute to its making. The individual minds can meet and commune only if they come outside themselves but they do this only by means of movement. It is the homogeneity of these movements that make the group aware of itself and that, in consequence, make it be. Once this homogeneity has been established and these movements have taken a definite form and been stereotyped, they serve to symbolize the corresponding representations. But these movements symbolize... I'm sorry... Yeah, but these movements symbolize representations only because they have helped to form them. Without symbols, moreover, social feelings could only have an unstable existence. So think about this, social feelings. So the, the fear with the mask, right? You want to establish the feeling of fear in a symbol that is durable within society, that's going to last, that when people see that symbol, it's going to bring back those, those emotions. That's what he's talking about. Without symbols, because really he, he's looking at in the religious sense of, of uh, transcendence, of divinity, of all stuff like that. But, but you can take these theories because these are conceptual theories and look at it, you know, take them and then apply them in different ways. So those those feelings are very strong so long as they are assembled mutually influencing one another but when they are but when the gathering is over they survive only in the form of memories that gradually dim and fade away if felt to themselves so think about our protests right the feelings that how how fervent these protests are think about when george floyd first died and we saw the protest in dc outside the church and they're burning the church in minneapolis in la in oakland so how do you keep that flame alive Since the group is no longer present and active, the individual temperaments quickly take over again. Wild passions that could unleash themselves in the midst of a crowd cool and die once the crowd has dispersed. And individual, individuals wonder with amazement how they could let themselves be carried so far out of character. But if the movements by which the, these feelings have been expressed eventually become inscribed on things that are durable, then they too become durable. These things keep bringing the feelings of individual minds and keep them perpetually aroused, just as would happen if the cause that first called them forth was still acting. Thus, while emblematizing is necessary if society is to become conscious of itself, so it is no less indispensable in perpetuating that consciousness. Hence, we must guard against seeing those symbols as mere artifices. A variety of labels placed on ready-made representations to make them easier to handle. Um, he can go on here, but <clears throat> I wanted to highlight, um, again, how are the feelings of these protests being perpetuated in society? Um, the mask is a symbol of fear, right? Uh, the new normal, the talk of the, of the new normal over and over again. 
corporations protest. So we, we see the corporations promoting the BLM. We see the protests promoting the BLM and Antifa. We see uh, the, the, the new normal. All these ways are which to, to establish establish these social feelings as facts, embed them within people's psyches. So when they're brought back up, right, the George Floyd, the BLM, the, the any, and really what I'm seeing as the black, um, the black man who's shot by the police, this is one of these instances because one, they're so rare from white cops, but I don't know if you guys saw recently as in Wisconsin where a black guy had a, gun he shot at police and a black officer ended up killing him and then they start protesting the fact that that happens um you know why would you be protesting a, a gentleman who just shot at police with an open fire and then he was also killed by a black cop and you're protesting racial justice and all this stuff it makes no sense it makes no sense but it by highlighting these things that, oh, police officers killed this man, this is almost the way in which these symbols, you know, this is a collective representation to reignite those feelings, right? We're talking about the dissipation of that fervor when the group goes away, right? When, when, the, when the collectivity dissipates into the mist, um, you know, people then kind of come back to their sobriety. They're not so wound up by their emotions. How do you keep people wound up by their emotions? And I think that... Uh, I think this idea of collective representations is very useful. Um, and, and so we can see then how society is being manipulated in a way and how this is leading to an influencing of individual minds. So the next one I want to get into is categories of understanding. Categories of understanding. And that is on 441. And so think about then critical race theory and how that works in our society. Um, let me change this up top. Exactly. Easier to steer the herd. Annie's totally on board. Yep. Got to keep people festered easier. And so, um, and so that's why this concept of collective representations is so interesting because what that does is really give us a sort of vocabulary to look at how her, the herd is driven, how the herd is herded by symbols, by symbols that then the culture and the society promote. Um, so again, that's why some of these theories that Durkheim talks about, they're very interesting. They're very interesting um, in how they can be understood in, in the contemporary landscape. Another concept is, again, categories of understanding, and it reads, Yet the problem is more complex insofar as the categories are concerned, for they are social in another sense, and, as it were, to a higher degree. Not only do they come from society, our categories, our conceptual categories come from society, but the very thing they express are, are social. It is not only that they are instituted by society, but also that their content is various aspects of the social being. The category of genus was at first indistinct from the concept of a human group. The category of time was the rhythm of social life and its habits. The space society occupies provided the raw material for the category of space. Collective force was the prototype for the concept of effective force, an essential element in the category of causality. Nevertheless, application to the social realm is not the only function of the categories. They extend to reality as a whole. Why is it then? that the models on which they were built have been borrowed have been borrowed from society the answer is that the preeminent concepts that have a preponderant role in knowledge indeed the function of the categories is to govern and contain the other concepts they form the permanent framework of mental life but to encompass such an object they must be molded on a reality of equally wide scope and so Categories then are agreed upon by society. They're shaped by society and they're agreed upon by society. 
Um, so I think this is really interesting. So categories are agreed upon and shaped by society. They provide permanent frameworks for mental life like space though he was talking about like space time all this stuff and that's how these concepts can be different amongst different societies amongst different groups but um i think again taking this and, and sort of applying it to the contemporary social landscape we can see how critical race theory provides categories that re establish and instantiate the things that they're trying to promote like a sort of anti-white sentiment anti-western christian understanding uh, anti-male right everything's against the patriarchy stuff like that so the categories which society is being promoted and then look at society at large the right the commercials the corporations the institutions the universities when we think of society this is what it all is hollywood the movie industry our entertainment um our books right we link of how many books now are um you know or how few books maybe would promote the the sort of values that most of you and i would agree with these are all ways in which to reshape, reconstruct the categories of understanding, the ways in which minds exist within a society. And so this is really the war that we're dealing with. And Durkheim, I think, is providing us with a sort of uh, a vocabulary, a language to understand that and how, how it's really working. So the categories of understanding then contain other categories like critical race theory, a, a category of understanding contains other categories like white privilege and all this stuff. So if you, that's why there's like a larger game being played and that the, you, you, they erect these categories. We start to embed these categories and then it provides the whole paradigm. You know, the, Dyer's apologetics in regards to paradigms and presuppositions. That's what this stuff is all about. These categories of understanding and how they're altered and changed and influenced. And then, and then, construct our mental categories and how we then look at the world and can, and then the feedback loop, right? If, if we if our mental categories are then altered by society, then we interact with society differently. Then the whole thing starts moving in a new direction. The next one that I wanted to talk about, and this one I think is really interesting uh, and, and useful in regards to looking at uh, some of the things going on right now in regards to society Oh, geez, I can't type cultural conflict. Oh, geez, I can't type at all. Gosh, I can't type it all. <clears throat> okay. So the next one I wanted to talk about was the cultural conflict based on varying societal ideals. 425. So check this out. And I think this really provides, again, a useful understanding of, of some of the cultural tension that we're seeing in society. A society is not constituted simply by the mass of individuals who comprise it, the ground they occupy, the things they use, or the movements they make, but above all, by the idea it has of itself. And there is no doubt that society sometimes hesitates over the manner in which it must conceive itself. It feels pulled in all directions. When such conflicts break out, they are not between the ideal and the real, or in, <laughs> between the ideal and the reality, but between different, I, between different ideals, between the ideal of yesterday and that of today, between the ideal that has the authority of tradition and that, and the one that is only coming into being. Studying how ideals come to evolve certainly has its place, but no matter how this problem is solved, the fact remains that the whole of it unfolds in the world of the ideal. Therefore, the collective ideal that religion expresses is far from being due to some vague capacity innate to the individual. Rather, it is in the school of collective life that the individual has learned to form ideals. I want to pause right there and again highlight 
Oh my gosh. I, I didn't even realize that I was off the screen. I want to highlight that. Um, <laughs> uh, base philosophy mom says, it's okay, we make you nervous. I get it. <laughs> you do, especially when I'm live. Um, that, uh, the collective ideal. So when we look at then the relativism within the perennialistic sort of fundamental principle. So it, think about the ideal of the left, right? We have the authority of tradition and we have the new one that's trying to establish itself in the present day. What is some of the, what are some of the presuppositions? Well, certainly perennialism is one of them, which is tied then to the concept of multiculturalism, right? These two things go together. And so as I've highlighted and many other people have that, that there's a fundamental presupposition of sort of relativism within these ideas and that dissolution of distinction is tied to open borders. It's tied to infinite numbers of genders. It's tied to all these different things. And so the definiteness that is part of our sort of phallogocentric tradition is, you know, it, it's absolutely at war with something that's to abolish all distinction and all boundaries itself. Again, something I've reiterated multiple times on this channel. It is by assimilating the ideals worked out by society that the individual is able to conceive of the ideal. It is society that, by drawing him into its sphere of action, has given him the need to raise himself above the world of experience, while at the same time furnishing him the means of imagining another. It is society that built this new world while building itself, because it is society that the new world expresses. There is nothing mysterious about the faculty of idealization, then whether in the individual or in the group, this faculty is not a sort of luxury, which man could do without, but a condition of his existence. If he had not acquired it, he would not be a social being, which is to say he would not be a man. To be sure, collective ideals tend to become individualized when they become incarnate in individuals. Each person understands them in his own way and gives them an individual imprint some elements being taken out and others being added as the individual personality develops and becomes an autonomous source of action. The personal ideal diverges from the social one. But if we want to understand that aptitude for living outside the real, which is seemingly so remarkable, we need to do, we all need to do all, I'm sorry, take three. All we need to do is relate to the social conditions on which it rests. So um so I think this is so interesting. Again, think about how many of us, I know myself, you know, I'll speak for myself, that kind of came out of the new age, came out of this paradigm which is the sort of leftist paradigm of perennialism, of relativism, of multiculturalism, of anti-christianity. Um that it it uh all this stuff is it only is able to flourish because individuals take it up and, and then they fight the battle, the societal battle between the ideals. And that every time we win, you know, a soul or we do uh, what, what's it called? Soul winning. Is that what Protestants call it when we convert people? Every time we convert a soul, we're, we're bringing in another soldier within this battle to, you know, really fight against and fight for the correct ideals. Now, I have a few more. Um, anybody have some questions? Um, Ray, the musician says, I think the same way is also for Orthodoxy and Protestant. The things I used to think is, oh, as a Protestant, you yeah. uh, know, mindset said, hi, can you name the big blue book on your side? Um, oh, are you talking about this one? This is the Dictionary of Gnosis and Western Esotericism. So this is uh, this is a huge dictionary by Brill, um, and it's for scholars in like Western esoteric traditions and stuff like that. Um, but it, it's like it's super expensive. You probably aren't going to be. I I probably shouldn't have bought it, but I did because I was so interested in that stuff at the time. Um, and then. Finally, Durkheim's definition of religion, again, getting back to this sort of, and I, I need, I should re 
name this stream uh, to something other. It should be like uh, um, social theories for today, uh, <laughs> because that's really what I'm using his book for is looking at these social theories. I'm, we're really talking less about religion, per se, than about these theories that we can use on, on our theoretical social tool belt and then look at society. Um, and he says, the ones who claim to be against labels just can't wait to give themselves multiple labels. Ex exactly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, base philosophy, Mom says, how many books do you own? Um, quite a few. I have, I'm surrounded by books, if you were able to see around me. And I have actually two tubs, like uh, the big plastic tubs like people buy to move, full of books uh, that aren't even in this room. Um, so I, I do have a ton. I have a ton of money wrapped up in books. I, I've probably spent so much money in books, it's ridiculous. Orthodoxy and Catholicism have better terminology when it comes to winning souls. The church militant and the church triumphant sound so much better and is more fitting. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, who was it? It was like uh, Stephen, the pastor Stephen something, the guy that got banned off, off YouTube and everything. He was the one that always talked about soul winning. Um, yeah, so... Uh, but the functionalist definition of religion here for Durkheim is that re a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is the thing, say, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church and all those who adhere to them. So basically, again, religion is all this big social phenomenon. Um <laughs> And he says, let the book battle begin. Patrick versus Jay versus Vox Day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would imagine that uh, they've probably, because they're older, they probably already acquired more books. I'd, I'd be the youngest out of that battle. Um, um, but I love books. And I per, I spend a lot of money buying books. Uh, and I, I don't buy any digital books. I don't like reading digitally for some reason. It just... It doesn't feel right. Um, so, um, again, like I said, I have my church class at seven. So I apologize. This stream was kind of rushed because um, I wanted to. I wanted to get something out before church, uh, before my church class. But I hadn't. I hadn't streamed for a week, you know, and so. I was kind of in a hurry. Again, I, I have a couple more points that I'm going to say for members only over at the website in regards to uh, how society humanizes individuals and then uh, his theory of huma, humans being the homo duplex. So I'll save that uh, for uh, another time. And we can just kind of chat for a few minutes. I have, I have a few minutes before I have to log off here. Um, so... I wanted to hop on because it, it's been a week since I streamed. Again, I had the wedding. The wedding went great, by the way. I had a speech. The speech went great. Um, so I had this. Um, the, it was funny because I, I had like these a, a few jokes like embedded within my speech. Um, technically, his brother was the best man, but his brother uh, was a little bit shy. So he they asked me to come up with something to say. They said, you know, we know that you don't have a problem speaking in front of people. So I said, OK, sure. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And so to begin uh, the wedding, or to begin my speech, I said, I had a joke, right? You want to move people in a certain direction and then you pull them back. So what was funny is a lot of the old people didn't catch the joke. <laughs> and I said, you know, everybody give, you know, give a hand for Sierra was the bride for how beautiful Sierra looks today and how, how well the wedding went. So everybody claps, you know, and then you say, well... I just wanted to begin by just really speaking on behalf of so many of us here, especially us millennials. We grew up with Disney films, and we've always sort of fantasized and dreamed about that special moment where we'd meet that person that we could never get out of our mind, that we just couldn't forget, and we just longed to be next to. That happened for Blake nine years ago when he met me. <laughs> and so... What was funny is the bride was actually sorting to tear up because she thought I was talking about her. 
Uh, but it was a planned joke, right? It was, the point was to make people laugh. Now, half the room laughed, as it seemed like. Uh, some people didn't catch the joke. But uh, overall, I got a lot of positive feedback from my speech. Um, but uh, uh, Radio Musician says, was the speech recorded? I'm sure somebody recorded it, but I doubt I'm going to share that with anybody online. Uh <laughs> But, uh, uh, I had a couple, I had a couple jokes built in and then I was also serious. So, you know, I told, I spoke about, you know, you want to be simple, uh, quick and, and short. You don't want to, um, you don't want to go on and on. Like when you're doing a speech at a wedding. <clears throat> so I did my joke. I told him how much I appreciate him. So like Blake is the gentleman who like helps me. One, he's a very good friend. He's the one that helps me build my website. He's the one that helped me do my membership stuff. He he helps me do my lo my logos. And so, um, I just talked about how thankful I am of him as a friend, how much I appreciate him, how he embodies a lot of ideals that I admire, and whether we are friends or not, that I respect him, and he kind of pushes me to want to be better. And then, I had another joke built in in regards to trust. So I was, so I was like. Uh, you know, if I had to use a few words to sort of sum up my friendship with Blake, it would be loyalty, you know, lots of fun, and trust. And I want to linger on this idea of trust for a second, because Sierra, the bride, is still pretty salty of the fact that Blake only trusts me to drive his car, <laughs> which is a true thing. We actually have gone back and forth because I hang out with him quite a bit. And she's always, I mean, it's like of a joke. She's not, su she's not really upset, but Jay, but Blake doesn't really like her driving her, his car. So, uh, so I did that again, her, the Blake and Sierra, they find it hilarious. Some people didn't, they're not catching the joke, but, uh, um, uh, I talked about how even in the first week that I had met Blake, we had gone on spring break in Fort Myers and, we may or may not have, or he may or may not have been a little bit in, intoxicated and asked me to drive his maroon Chrysler Crossfire stick shift back from Florida to Indiana. And I said, you know, that happened in the first week I knew him. So I think it's fair to say our relationship progressed a little bit faster than yours. <laughs> Again, got, got a few laughs there. And then I just talked about how, um, you know, as a support group that the, that the wedding, again, guess that a lot of people there aren't, wouldn't, wouldn't be considered, you know, real Christian, uh, you know, real Christian, not that, that they're not Christians, but like, they're not talking about God a lot or something like that. So they asked me to keep it, you know, not get too theological or anything, which I said, oh, of course I'm not going to, but I talked about how, you know, today was more than just a sort of ritual. Uh, today was more than just a celebration of friends and family that this is a support group and that you guys have made a covenant for life with each other and that the people in this room are going to be here to be shoulders of support, ears to listen, because life is difficult and you guys are going to probably say things that you regret to each other. And me and like all I pointed all the rest of the groomsmen and the brides or whatever the bride maids or whatever um that we're going to be here to keep you guys together and so they liked that and then I said a few more things and then ended it but it overall went really well and I was the only one to not read my speech I had bullet points in my head so I knew what I wanted to highlight and I just went through it and uh and hit it but I don't know why I'm telling you guys all this stuff um yeah. Anyways, um, anybody have any uh, thoughts before I get out of here? I really need to re rename this stream. I should say um, social theories for today. Emil, Emil Durkheim and like social theories for today or something like that. Um, but you guys, any, any questions, any thoughts? I have a few more minutes before I can probably hop off. Uh, okay. Well, I'll take that as a no. Um, again, anybody who would be interested, please check out my website. Go to davidpatrickcarry.com, churchoftheeternallogos.com. Takes you to the same place. And we do have our 
memberships up and ready. Um, uh, Annie says, Patrick, have you heard of Matthew Siegel? Oh, thou art that. Oh, on YouTube. I found out, I found out about him when looking up phenomenology. It would be interesting to see you reason him out of his delusion. I'm not familiar with him. I'd have to check it out. Um, Rated Musician says, you got to do those split videos of your stream. I, I'm not sure what you mean. Split videos of your stream. Uh, maybe Are you talking about clips? Um, JKXY said, do you plan on doing a stream on the negative effects of technology has on society? Um, I could, but I could also talk about maybe a little bit more nuanced Um the negatives and the benefits, because uh, I, I do have a video talking about the Tower of Babel and how that relates much to much to technology and, and technological theory and technocracy and stuff like that. Base Philosophy Mom says, do you have any pets? Yes, I have a 13-year-old pit bull that uh, has really traveled around the country with me. If I If you're on my phone, I'd flip it over. I have a canvas of him on the beach laying there with his paws like this with the golden gate bridge behind him so yeah i have a pit bull i adopted him when i was let's see 19 um and i thought i wanted to be a dog trainer at one point in my life i'd read pa the pack leader by caesar milan and i didn't know what i wanted to do with my life i knew i liked animals so um i knew i liked animals so i decided that I was going to adopt a dog. I went to the animal shelter and the only dog that wasn't like jumping up on the fence, like barking was this big pit bull. And I met with him. He was very friendly. And I, at the time I was 19. So I convinced my parents to let me uh, get him. And Oh, I haven't read that, Annie. I love the Jean-Claude Larche book about tech recommended by Father Deacon Ananias. Great stuff. I haven't read that. I need to check that out. Thank you for saying that because I didn't hear Father Deacon recommend that, but I will watch it. Jean-Claude Larche. Let me put that on. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll definitely check that out. Um... So I adopted this pit bull. Then I trained him, which I did that in like a month. And so I realized, oh, geez, I don't want to be a dog trainer. That's too easy. But that was sort of the first domino, I feel like, in my life in regards to becoming who I am today because it was me doing something totally new, becoming competent at it, and then moving on to the next thing. And so that led then to uh, taking school more seriously. That led to becoming a biology major. That led to eventually studying Chinese. That led to going to China for two summers. That led to competing in martial arts. That led to deciding I want to go to graduate school. That led to my former YouTube channel, all that stuff that eventually led to, um, eventually led to going to get my doctorate. Oh, Neuro poster said recent Orthodox convert here. Thanks so much for your channel, bro. Well, th thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. If anything I've said has helped you in any way, uh, find orthodoxy or gain a better relationship with God, the one true living God, um, you know, glory be to God. It's not me, you know. Thank you, though. I really appreciate the kind words. Father Deacon mentioned it in one of his videos about technology and orthodoxy. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, lately, probably the last three weeks, I feel like my life's been so busy. I feel like every day I feel like I'm running out of time. I'm running behind. I got to get somewhere. I got to do something. And I feel a bit exhausted. Like, like my life is moving really fast and I feel like I'm just like behind trying to hold on or something like that. <clears throat> Oh, Ray the Musician says, Neuroposter, I am too. Church of the Eternal Logos has helped me a lot. Well, thank you, Ray the Musician. I really appreciate that, man. And Neuroposter, I am humbled 
very humbled that I have done aided in any way in, in understanding uh, orthodoxy better or finding God or anything like that, you know. So again, before these streams, I always pray to God to be a conduit, to be a tool for His will, that His will be done, not mine. Um, so yeah, so I appreciate it. I'm humbled by it. Um, Annie Beanie said, is it appropriate for Orthodox to do martial arts? What kind of exercise is appropriate? Um, I don't see why doing martial arts would be inappropriate. It depends on like how spiritual you get with that stuff, of course. But, um, um, certainly forms of like yoga and spiritual practices of other traditions, I, I could see, you know, you talk about Shaolin monks or forms of, you know, sh Kung Fu, because that's going to be tied with Chinese Buddhism and Taoism, stuff like that. Uh, but in regards to like military martial arts and, and, and uh, um, jujitsu, like I went to a jujitsu class with a guy from my church. So I think it's very orthodox in regards to sort of be confident in the ability to defend oneself. And he says, uh, please take time to refresh and rest. Mr. Patrick, take care of yourself. Yeah, I know. I, I really need to. Um, I really need to, uh, especially this last weekend. I was like more drinking than I, I'm not much of a drinker and I drink more than I usually do. So I noticed that has a big toll on my body. And just getting back to my eight to nine hours of rest. And then I kind of hit the day pretty hard. Usually I do the gym first thing in the morning. So if you guys are interested in following more of sort of my daily life and like what I do in regards to going to the gym, doing different stuff, um, I do recommend you following my Instagram. That's where I post most of like my actual life stuff as opposed to the other social media is really just a promotion of this YouTube channel, but Instagram, Instagram's where you get a, a lot more of sort of my personal life. So if you guys are interested, just throwing it out there, not that you need to, or get an Instagram. If you don't have one, don't, but if you are on Instagram and you're interested, that's the link to sort of check out what I do uh, on a regular basis. Neuroposter said, I used to have a channel called true dill Tom. If you heard of it, the channel was all postmodern stuff. I see the copy of grammatology yep grammatology exactly dude you you know what's going on then um yeah for sure <laughs> blaze philosophy is on you get eight to nine hours of sleep i can't even remember the last time i allowed to sleep that much i have to i know that i am not i am not a, a person that functions highly off low amounts of sleep, but, um, I am a very light sleeper. So I have to take more melatonin than most people are used to, to be able to sleep throughout the night. Cause I just have a really bad problem of not being able to sleep like throughout the night. So the whole eight to nine hours I had, I've had to devote myself to, because I have this problem called superior oblique myokymia. I have a muscle on the back of my eye that spasms and that thing spasms when I don't get enough sleep. And so, um, really trying to hit that heavy and get, and get my night's sleep is, is what, uh, is what has really kind of helped settle that thing down. Neuroposter says, buy yourself a drink. The different poses in yoga stem from old offerings to the Hindu gods for genuine health and well-being. get in the gym and hit that pull up, push leg split, laugh my ass off. I totally agree, Neuroposter. I'm all about the gym. I love that. And thank you very much, brother. I really do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you ever use blue light blocking glasses? No, I, I have a program on my computer that blocks blue light once the sun goes down. It's not that. It's like I have my brain. I can't turn it off. That's why I have to take the melatonin. And I take large amounts. I mean, I'm talking like between 60 and 80 milligrams of melatonin a night, uh, fairly regularly. So not recommended at all, but it's the only way that I can like sleep for a, a solid eight, a solid eight hours. I can't do it. 
<laughs> base philosophy mods. I, I function best on 10 hours. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I, w I can't sleep that long. I wish I could because I'd probably feel a whole lot better. But thank you very much, Neuroposter. I really appreciate that, brother. Um, anyways, I'm going to hop off here. My Zoom class is starting for church, and we're going to be getting into St. Athanasius on the Incarnation. Um, yeah, JKXY said, uh, sometimes it takes me up to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half to fall asleep. Yeah, I... I'm just a very, very light sleeper. Like if there's noise, I have to have white noise. If anybody is snoring, I'm going to be up the whole night. I cannot go to sleep if somebody in the same room or vicinity is snoring. It just, it drives me nuts. If like, I have to have a fan, but if the fan has like a squeaky something and it like, nope, I can't do it. <laughs> and he says 10 hours of sleep sounds delicious. Yeah, I bet. Anyways, guys, thanks. I'm going to hop off here um, and my channel still has 32,000 uh, vestigial subs. <laughs> we should collab so I can spread the word of orthodoxy. Yeah, for sure, brother. Um, Neuropost are really, yeah. Um, let's, you know, feel free. I don't know what social medias you're on. Again, I don't know who you are. Um I can check out your YouTube channel for sure, but feel free to DM me on anything, Instagram, uh, Twitter, or you can email me at church of the eternal logos at gmail.com. Um, and we can set something up always, always down to collab and, and talk with, with fellow people who have found orthodoxy. So, uh, that sounds like a great video. So hit, hit me up. We can set something up anyways, guys, I'm going to get out of here. I am going to read some St. Athanasius with fellow parishioners from the church. Uh, I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Take care. God bless. And I will see you guys next time. Bye. Okay. Hmm.